Welcome to another Social Distancing Social from Future Tense, partnership of Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. Today, we are going to be talking about the future of work and specifically whether we are currently in that future here in our uh, home offices. Uh, with our Zooms set up. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Bridget Schulte, who wrote the book uh, about the elusive work-life balance and uh, is also the director of New America's Better Life Lab. Hi, Bridget. Oh, hey, hi. Sorry, I was trying to take myself off of mute, but somebody did it for me, so thank you. Hey, great to be here. So you're kind of the perfect person to be talking to because you've spent years studying how people work. Um, and obviously we're in the midst of a dramatic shift right now. Uh, millions of Americans are working from home. Uh, I guess the first question is the biggest one, which is, is this here to stay? You know, it's a great question. And I think the first thing too, that we all need to acknowledge is that not everybody is able to work at home or is working at home. And we really need to uh, make sure that in this conversation, we also call out the healthcare workers who are not able to work remotely, the delivery workers, the grocery store workers, you know, that that adds another dimension to this whole question of future of work. Um, you know, so a number of people can't work at home, can't work remotely, but a number of people can. And what's so interesting is I think that what we're that this coronavirus really gives us an opportunity you know, kind of to disrupt the old way of doing things. We've been able to work remotely for a couple decades, but there's been a lot of resistance to it. And that's what's so fascinating is right now we don't have a choice. And so we don't have that same kind of friction or resistance. Uh, in a lot of the reporting that I've done and a lot of the social science research looking at work and work cultures, what is so clear is that in, in the United States, we have this face time bias that we think that the best workers work in the office, work all the time. You know, there's lots of research that shows that we reward the workers that we can see, that managers tend to think, well, if I can see you, then I know you're working. And how many of us have walked around offices late at night and seen people who are there, but they're playing solitaire or they're answering emails or like, you know, buying something online. They're not quote unquote working, but they know that that's what is valued in the workplace. And so they're there as almost like a performance of work. So I do feel like the, the, this virus gives us an opportunity to kind of strip off some of those really damaging kind of illusions that we were working under that frankly really disadvantaged women, really disadvantaged anybody who wasn't sort of in the current power structure. Um, anybody who needed to have caregiving responsibility, but anybody who needed to work flexibly, you know, for the last couple of decades, flexible work, remote work, it's been seen as an accommodation or a perk or a nice to have for a working mom or, you know, sort of a lesser worker, somebody who's not all in in the office. And this really gives us an opportunity to say, you know, it isn't, it, you know, that is not how we can use remote work and that those are not the best workers. It will really give us an opportunity to redefine what good work is and who does it. So I want to come back to a lot of those topics, uh, healthcare workers, uh, women in the workplace, and this idea of being rewarded for, for being present. But I think the, the first thing I want to ask you is, this is not the first time that people have said, oh, work doesn't need to be done in the office anymore. I mean, this is a prediction that we see come along with every single technological improvement going back to the telegraph where people say well now there is no more need to congregate uh you see these like absurd predictions with video conferencing getting off the ground that this is the end of the city and that no one's gonna need to live here and if anything we've only seen increasing returns to agglomeration economies more and more firms paying fortunes to get their workers uh, or to get their offices into the places where the best workers are um, so what makes this any different? That is such a good question. You know, when you started bringing that up, I remember like when I started listening to Buckminster Fuller, you know, and the whole idea of the global village. And that just sounded so ideal to me, like, wow, that you could live anywhere and you could do really cool work from anywhere. And I do think that our technology enables more and more of that, but you're right. We're very wedded to these notions that we need to be physically together, which is one of the reasons why I think this social distancing is so very difficult uh, for so many of us. Uh, but there is, uh, I mentioned a FaceTime bias, and I think it's a good question. I do think that the virus will change things. How much? 
how far and for how long, those are really, you know, those are really excellent questions that I don't think we know the answers to. But I think any, you know, anytime you think about change, there's always like little seeds that are planted and then pull back and then, you know, maybe change in certain areas. So I don't think that we're going to see this massive sea change just because that's not the way change works. But I do think that we're going to start seeing some changes that will be permanent in certain areas and then very stubborn places that will be very resistant to change. And, and I suppose also sometimes you need uh, a massive disruptive event to force people to make changes that might otherwise have sat on the sidelines or seemed like too big a gamble. I mean, firms are conservative by nature, and it would make sense that they would be reluctant to try out some big experiment. And now we've basically forced it on. Well, but the interesting thing is, you know, you talk about an, an experiment, and I think this is important to remember just how strong this resistance is to change. There have been fabulous, amazing control, you know, controlled blind trials, you know, really well constructed social science research about new kinds of work systems, remote work, flexible work, um, results only work environment, a family supportive um, systems that encourage flexible and remote work. Great research by amazing uh, um, practitioners out there and, and researchers. And I will tell you that almost every single one has found great benefits, more productivity, um, uh, you know, better communication, better work-life balance, uh, greater health, reduced stress, um, more connection with uh, family and home, more work-life balance, but you know, like good, really great measurable benefits at work and at home, you know, and with health benefits. And in all, in just about every single case, once new management has come in, all of those programs have gone. You know, they're just, they're flushed. They're like, oh no, all hands on deck. We're going back to what we know. So even in this pandemic, in this crisis, it's almost like it'll, it'll, it'll act like a gigantic exposure therapy for a lot of people who've never had this kind of experience before. I think, honestly, I think workers have known that they can work this way. They've needed time to have concentrated work. Uh, you know, in some of my reporting, we end up talking to people who say that they will take vacation days or sick days just so that they can get their concentrated work done at home because they can't do it at work, which is crazy. But that's a, but a, the way that we've set up kind of our work systems has contributed to this kind of endless overwork where we're never done because we're always so interrupted in the office. So that if we're going to really do our, our concentrated work, people do it in off hours so that work kind of has spilled over into all aspects of our lives. And so this gives us, this is another opportunity to see how work spills over when you're here in my home office, you're in your home. You know, it's very difficult to set those boundaries. Uh, and yet, part of what's happened is that we have these old systems, which, which um, value FaceTime and coming together and the old fashioned meeting, clashing with these new systems of email and tech where you can work in asynchronous fashion. You don't have to be together to do good work. And what we've done in the last probably 10, 20 years is that we're doing both of these systems at the same time. They're clashing. <laughs> we don't know how to do them, either one of them very well. And that's what's contributed to so much overwork and craziness. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this gives us an opportunity to see they're two different systems and and maybe we can learn how to work more strategically and effectively and recognize we need to toggle between collaborative time, you know, being together physically or however, and then also time off in a way where you can actually put your head down and actually get your work done. Right. I was reading a study that suggested that one of the reasons that uh, employees, that firms keep asking employees to come to work and employees keep coming to work and basically this system of uh, office work developed in the late 19th century persists almost without any change uh, to this day is uh, not so much that people get into a room and have this kind of magical moment of <laughs> it's not like it you know it's not like a movie scene um, but rather and I'm pulling this from this uh, study that Google did they talk about how their best teams uh, propagate in person what they call psychological safety and it's the idea that you feel comfortable uh, expressing ideas and um, uh, maybe even criticism around your coworkers because it's easy to read them and understand that you're still in balance here and that you're voicing something that's acceptable. And that when you 
work online, it can become a lot harder to read people to understand where those boundaries are. And as, as a result, you see a kind of self-censorship in, in, in ways that I'm not saying that people won't necessarily criticize uh, a project that's gone wrong, but it's just this, the, this low level of trust that gets propagated by people seeing each other in person has not, is not something we've been able to replicate online yet. Not yet. I think that that's really true because we haven't really, there are some totally distributed teams. There are some places that work totally remotely. Like I'm thinking of Basecamp as one example. Um, Artemis is in Seattle. That's another example. There, They tend to be tech firms or consulting firms. So there are some that have figured out how to work remotely and they have to work at creating what you're, that very important element that you talk about, psychological safety. How do you create cultures of high trust? And th you know that takes work, that takes effort. And you're, you're right, we haven't figured out how to do that. A text can sound very odd. An email, if you're, you're kind of in a bad mood, even if you don't mean it, <laughs> can come off very, very badly or very poorly. Uh, so it, it really takes skill to be able to communicate effectively in a remote setting. But that aside, you know, where we go from here, whether we're all going to be distributed and always working from our home offices, I don't know that that's the future. You know, I think in some certain in industries and companies that certainly will be. But for most people, you know, when you think about, um, you know, you talk to, um, uh, you know, workplace consultants and, and, you know, kind of looking at work redesign, most what they consider um, high performance, flexible cultures are a mix of in-person time, collaborative time, and remote time. There is sort of like this toggling back and forth that, that really leads, you know, that to me is probably more of a hybrid going forward, you know, taking the best of that in-person time. You know, I miss my team, I really like them. You know, I really like when we get together and, uh, you know, whether it's brainstorming or finding connections that, you know, that helps you, you know, you bounce ideas off each other and, and it motivates you. There's definitely a value to that in-person collaboration. There's also a value in then coming and, and finding that time and space to do your own work. And then it's, I think that finding that balance between toggling is really important. Mm -hmm. And what's unfortunately what's happened in so many workplaces is there's way too much what I would call over collaboration. Like it's ballooned like crazy. And I'm talking about all those, excuse my language, can I swear on Zoom? Goddamn meetings. I mean, oh my God, you can get nothing done and you'll have your, your whole day just going from meeting to meeting to meeting, you get to the end of the day, you've been really busy and you don't know what you've done. And maybe you've answered a couple emails. It's, uh, we're in this kind of like, just uh, a death spiral, I think, in, in, in kind of new and old ways, just clashing in, in our modern workplaces. But I really hope that this corona situation helps us realize that meetings are important, but to be really strategic about how you have them. I want to share with you uh, an email that got sent out to employees at the Wall Street Journal. Now, a, a newspaper is in some ways the classic uh, workplace where you want people to be in the room. You know, if you've seen old movies, All the President's Men or The Post or something like that, you see a copy editor is yelling across to the managing editor, phones ringing all the time, reporters jabbering on and then shouting across the room. It's classic office work. Uh, now, here is what the uh, editors of the Wall Street Journal told their employees when the coronavirus shutdown happened. They said, when you're working from home, you should uh, respond within just a few minutes to Slack or Google Hangout messages. Make sure your cell phone number is readily accessible. Uh, keep your phone's ringer turned on and answer it when it rings. Now is not the time to be screening calls. Uh, and so on. <laughs> Keep the camera on during hangouts. And it all, it all made me think that they really think that we, uh, the employer, the employees, are going to take this opportunity to just, you know, not get dressed in the morning and wake up at 1030 a.m. and not do any work. So this is what, okay, so the first thing that I will say is that I worked in newsrooms for most of my career, I was at the Washington Post for nearly 17 years. I never worked in the newsroom. 
you know, I was part of a, a team that won a Pulitzer Prize and I wrote that story at my kitchen table, you know? So I don't think that you have to, you know, I, 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 I've seen all of those old movies, but I didn't work that way. And frankly, it's really difficult to concentrate when you've got people yelling and slamming down phones. So, I, you know, I think that some of that is a nostalgia for how we think we should work. And I think that you, you raise a really, really good point. When you send out an email like that, you really infant, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this right, infantilizing your, your employees. You're, you're not signal, signaling that you trust them. You're not signaling that you think that they're going to do the right thing and do good work. Who cares if you get up at 1030 in the morning? Who cares if you're in your pajamas? If the mission of your work is to write a report and write a kick-ass piece and get it in by the five o'clock deadline, who cares if you're in your pajamas when you do that or not? I think this is what I'm hoping that the coronavirus will help us strip away some of these really outdated notions about what we need in order to do good work. Have you seen any examples of employers uh, trying to keep tabs on their employees as they work remotely, trying to find a way to um, basically replicate in the home setting what they've been able to do in the office, which even if you think is basically BS, they can still kind of look out from the corner office and see all the heads in the cubicles and know everyone's at work. Well, there are, there are examples. I've spoken with people who are doing a lot of consulting with companies and they're trying to figure out how to make this change. And that's the first thing that these consultants will say that a lot of managers, a lot of CEOs will say, it's like, well, how will I know? How will I know people are really working? And then the response back to them is like, well, how do you really know they're working when they're in the office? Yeah, how do you really know? How do you measure what work is? And I think this is what the coronavirus is showing us, that in so many of our workplaces, we don't really measure work. We measure FaceTime and presence. So if you're there, then I assume you're working. And then we measure hours. So if you're there for a long time, then I assume not only are you working, but wow, you must be working really hard. And this is something that I ran up against because I did, I have worked remotely. I've worked in bureaus and then I've worked on my own. I, when I had kids, I would sort of sneak around and work remotely. And I do think that it hurts you, you know, in our FaceTime culture. There's a lot of plum assignments that get handed out in hallways. There's a lot of that kind of, you know, interstitial chit chat. So there is a value to that. So I recognize that I made a calculated choice in doing that. But at the same time, what is my mission? My mission is not to kind of have chit chat in the office. My mission is to do really report and write great stories. And so that's what I think coronavirus is forcing managers. It's forcing them to think much harder about what are realistic metrics in terms of how to measure good work. You can, I, I, I see myself in the monitor and I sound angry and it's because I am angry <laughs> because this is really what's kept women back. This is what's kept people with caregiving responsibilities back. You know, there's research that shows that if you walk by a man's empty office, you automatically think, oh, wow, he's out. He must be out on an, on an assignment. He's out with a client. You walk by a woman's empty office and you automatically think, oh, she's home with her kids. You know, she's a slacker. She's not working hard. You know, and when, when I worked, you know, I still work remotely quite a bit. The research shows you actually work longer hours. You actually work harder and you're actually more productive when you're working remotely. And I don't think that's a necessarily a good thing. I think part of the reason that happens is because you know that you're at a disadvantage in a FaceTime culture. And so you're trying to overdo it to show your commitment. And so maybe this is another thing that coronavirus can also strip away this kind of ridiculous mask <laughs> that you can do good work in your pajamas. You know, and on my team, uh, we say we have, I, I, I try to, um, you know, walk the talk. So I believe in a flexible and remote work environment. I believe in coming together to, to, to collaborate. And the way that you have to operate is be really clear on what your mission is, be really clear on what your priorities are, be really clear on your roles and responsibilities and who does what, when your deadlines are and what your standards are that you expect. And then you, then you trust people. You have right. to have a high sense of trust to let them go and do their thing. I had a, an intern who came in one day and she'd been at the doctor and she was really stressed out. And she goes, I'm so sorry I came in late. And I looked at her and I said, in a high performance, flexible culture, there is no late. Just do your job. I want to ask you about this, uh, uh, the, the gender issue here. Uh, the typical working pattern in this country has been, since the rise of the dual earner household, that American women have made career sacrifices for childcare. Uh, 
do you think that the perceived acceptability of working from home would help women in that position maintain their uh, professional ambitions or I guess at the same time, um, would, that, uh, would, would that help um, men spend less time in the office and spend more time doing the domestic work uh, that they often neglect in favor of their uh, professional uh, lives? Well, I think what's really important to remember here when we're talking about remote work and why there's been a resistance to it, you know, not only the, there's this FaceTime bias, but a lot of remote work policies sprang up in the 1990s as part of women's initiatives. You know, once we had the technology, if you look in most work environments, it was sort of thought of as an accommodation, like for people on the mommy track. Oh, well, we don't want to, we've invested in these women, so maybe they're not going to get to the C-suite, but we don't want to lose them and our numbers are going to look better if we keep them. So the, the remote work was sort of seen as a way to kind of sort of throw a bone to women, so to speak. Oh, I have no idea. Well, 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 then what ended up happening is then that it became really siloed and became so gendered that if you were a man, you were actually more punished if you actually asked for those kinds of policies. So they became so associated with gender. So really, honestly, when you say what needs to happen now, and I think what coronavirus is showing us, it's not just women who are working at home right now. It's everybody because we have to because lives are on the line. And so what really needs to happen is to move the idea that remote and flexible work is only for women or only for caregivers or only for like restless millennials, that it's really something that everybody can take advantage of. And when you look also, you know, women tend to use the more formal policies, but when you ask like BLS and other surveys, like who's working remotely or who's working flexibly, you know who does is men. Men do a lot more flexible work. When you think about, you know, the CEOs, they're off on the golf course. They work very flexibly. They often work from home, you know? And so I think we need to kind of have this reimagining of what flexible and remote work is and make it available to everyone. That changes the way that we think of who's a good worker. It also enables more people to share more fairly at home because, you know, the, the research is clear. Women are still doing twice the amount of housework and childcare that men are. And, you know, a lot of times people blame men for that and, oh, aren't they terrible? But you know what? It's very difficult for men to make any other choice right now when our workplaces are demanding that they be all in 24 seven or that they face this kind of, you know, uh, flexibility, stigma, or bias. Right. Uh, I want to ask you about something you said earlier, which was that uh, you you told you told someone that there there is no late, and and that makes me wonder as we shift from a nine to five culture, which is about showing up at the office, being there for a certain amount of time, putting the work in, and then going home, towards one that's more oriented around fulfilling tasks and actually showing accomplishments. Uh, when does the workday end, especially for people who have maybe less defined um, tasks to finish and are in less of a leadership position, uh, less of a position to decide when uh, their day is done? I know that France passed a few years ago this law that uh, made everyone very envious over here, which was, I think it was for government workers prohibiting them from looking at their email over the weekend. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think as workers, what we should be asking for here uh, in terms of uh, ways to make sure that we're not responding to Slack and email at 7.30 in the morning or 10 at night. Yeah, well, I think one of the first things that I would say to that, who works nine to five? You know, even in a FaceTime environment, <laughs> there, you know, there is no nine to five anymore. There hasn't been for a couple decades. Americans work among the longest hours of any advanced economy. You know, the, the numbers on the whole don't, you know, don't look as high as they are because we've got really what's happened in our workforce. We've kind of got this bifurcation where you've got knowledge workers. Really, when you look at the time diary data from the 1980s on, the number, the, the hours for knowledge workers have just gone up and up and up. Crazy. Like we do more overwork than most other places. And then lower wage workers, the hours have gone down, you know, so that now we have this sort of fictional middle <laughs> that nobody works in between. But you know, you've got a lot of underwork for, for lower wage workers. But to, to that point of like, when does the workday end? You could say that right now. When does the workday end? When you have these overwork cultures that are, that are expecting FaceTime and then expecting you to log back on in the evening. So I think it's a bigger question that it's not just the coronavirus. It's not just remote work. We need to be asking of our work systems, our workplaces uh, in general. 
how much is enough? When are you done? Um, I think that these are all really important questions. You know, we don't work at factories anymore where we've got the whistle that tells you your shift has ended. And it, it's like we need to find those ways in ourselves and we need to get, um, we need to get buy-in in our workplaces and in our managers to try to figure out, you know, what is reasonable within a, you know, within a 24 hour window so that we're not always on because that kind of bleed of work into life, it's just, it's robbing us of everything that makes life worth living. I want to, I want to ask also about the class divide here. I pulled up a paper that I found this morning that's looking at, uh, the share of jobs that can be done from home organized by metropolitan area. And you see, it's really, really uneven. Um, it's more or less what you'd think, which is that the more uh, knowledge worker heavy metros, uh, the top five are for um, working from home, for the share of jobs that can be done from home are San Jose, uh, Washington, DC, uh, Durham, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, and San Francisco. And those are all between 40 and 50% uh, in terms of the share of jobs that could be done from home. But what's really interesting about this paper is that it shows that the uh, weighted by wage, it's way higher. So if you look at San Jose, 63, only uh, in San Jose, 48% of the jobs can be done from home, but 63% of the wages uh, are part of those jobs that can be done from home. And that, that trend persists across the, uh, the other cities as well. So I'm wondering what you make of this idea of working from home as a privilege thing, as a, as a, as a class marker, uh, that the commute becomes something that uh, is considered a, a kind of a, a, low, uh, a sort of lower status activity to have to actually leave your house to go to work? And that's a, you know, I think it's, it's so important, and that's why I opened with like let's re let's recognize here that not everybody can work at home. It is it is a sign of privilege that you can do it. It is it is something that knowledge workers can do. Something that requires you know, education. It requires the ability to you know to have technology, to have uh, you know to be able to have Wi-Fi, to have um, you know the 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 resources to to have a home office. So that is not everybody. And I think it's so important as we, as so many of us are doing this kind of remote work to recognize that we are in positions of enormous power. And that right now, the people who are going to work, I, I spoke with a woman who works at Walmart, she's terrified. She's terrified to go to work, you know? And so think about that, you know, here we are, we're, we're, we're staying kind of safe in our bubbles. And the people who are going out to work are literally putting their lives on the line. So I think it's an, a very important thing to remember that this is a, this is a, a marker of class. And moving forward, what is that going to mean? Um, you know, uh, I, I think that in a larger sense, you know, I know we're talking about remote work, but I think that what this virus is doing, it's really, it's really calling into question work on such a huge level. So how we do remote work and how we effectively use technology is one. What it means for low wage workers. I mean, we've got 3 million people in the last week applying for unemployment benefits. And now they're all gonna lose their health care. So what does that, you know, we've got uh, the rise in what I call like the crapification of jobs. We've got so many of these jobs that are poorly paid, that people get stuck in, that there is no uh, kind of uh, exit. This gives us an opportunity to really think about, you know, how did we get here and how do you create decent work with good pay and benefits? You know, this gives us an opportunity to think about the social contract. We have now shifted, you know, risk from, you know, companies that would take care of people or the sense that government was there with a safety net. We've shifted so much work in the last uh, risk in the last 40 years to individual workers. We're going to reap that problem right now as people through no fault of their own are losing their jobs and through, through no fault of their own are losing their health care. So that's another area that, that really requires, we'll, we'll be thinking about a third area really briefly is it's, it's really forcing us to really rethink the role of government. We just now have emergency paid sick days legislation that passed after years of recalcitrance and reluctance to do anything. We've got emergency paid family leave because we are in this emergency. So I think it gives us an opportunity to really rethink what is the role of government? And then finally, and probably most importantly, what this virus is really making us do is think, what is the economy for? You know, right now it's all about profits and it's about markets. 
and we are seeing how that is completely broken and failing. Will this give us an opportunity to think about what it is that we value and how do we create systems around value, the value of life, the value of care, the value of thriving? You know, I, I think that there are opportunities now to have much tougher conversations that weren't going anywhere before this. One of the things that I am working on when I'm not at Slate is a book about parking. Oh. And one of the interesting things about parking is that parking is provided in such a way that it's designed to be more or less a mirror of society. So you see the estimations of how many people are going to need to park uh, at, say, a movie theater go up in the summer because of summer blockbusters. And at the mall, they go up in uh, December because of Christmas shopping. And uh, in offices, they are always, always designed to provide more spaces than anyone needs. Uh, because it turns out that very rarely is every single employee at the firm uh, in the office at once. I'm wondering if you have seen uh, physical modifications that uh, stem out of early remote work experiments, um, either at the office or at home, or maybe more broadly, in the way the city is shaped. Um, one thing that I uh, know about in commuting is that the the uh, transit service remains very much oriented around the nine to five job uh, in such a way that basically works to the advantage of people who have that uh, typical, but as you say, um, basically outdated uh, job structure. Many people, especially in, in retail work, work all kinds of odd shifts. Uh, and, and, uh, and anybody who runs errands or, or sort of does odd jobs during the day finds that the bias of service towards nine to five doesn't make that much sense. Um, so outside in the physical world, in terms of changes, the way cities, offices, houses are designed, any impacts of remote work visible now? Uh, yeah, that's such a great question. Wow, a book about parking. I haven't thought about parking other, other than when I'm like swearing when I can't find a place. But um, so one of the first things that a lot of studies have found out of remote work is that companies, um, you know, when they were looking for places to cut, and particularly after, say, the 2008, um, the last economic implosion that we had, um, they realized that they could save on real estate costs if they had much more remote work or they had a certain part of the portion of their workforce working from home. You know, so I think that was part of it. I think another thing that you started to see was much more open office plans and the idea of hot desking that you wouldn't necessarily have a desk. You would kind of you know, we're kind of like you could come and go and sit and, um, uh, you know, be in this kind of like open, open space, which I, I think that subsequent research has shown is actually really terrible for actually getting work done. You know, um, I think the, the research that, uh, that I always point to is that in the modern work environment, the average knowledge worker is interrupted every three minutes. And it takes you about 20 minutes to get back to where you were. So when you think that that's how we spend so much of our days, um, you know, anything that would disrupt that, I think, is welcome. But going back to your point about um, physical changes, um, you know, I do think that you saw some firms think that they could they could realize real estate savings. Um, but again, I, it, you know, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that about one in four Americans worked remotely some of the time. So um, it's, it certainly hasn't been this like massive sea change. And so, you know, you could, you could be in part of that statistic and work remotely like once a month. So um, I, I think there's been some changes and certainly in, um, in more tech inflected areas, um, but it has, I, you know, there, there's still plenty of places that expect people to come into the office and have huge fancy offices. Right. Um, all right, so I think we're gonna move to take some questions now. Uh, Here's one uh, from uh, Margaret that's uh, sort of related to what I was asking, but, but, but asks more of the question of how we can plan around this. And, and her question is, if we are in fact seeing a change in how people work, buy stuff and communicate, how should cities look at this regarding planning and revenue generation? Excuse me, this is from Robert, uh, not Margaret. Uh, also, if density is problematic for disease spread, does this dovetail with the ability to work from home? Uh, and I guess those are, those are two pretty separate questions, but the first one is, should we plan differently? And the second one is, should we plan differently based on uh, thinking about disease, or is this, or is the sort of reckoning we're having now 
more or less uh, actually independent of the sort of virus problem that we're, we're dealing with. Well, I'll let you take on the, you know, the, you're the expert on cities and planning, but what I will say is I think that this really shows, and this is not the first time that we've gone through a pandemic where this has been the case that's been made. We need to have much better infrastructure to enable people to work from home more easily, uh, to enable uh, schools to continue, because we have, you know, there are natural disasters, there are, um, you know, there are storms. This was a lot of the discussion during the H1N1 um, flu pandemic. You know, we've been here before. We're going to be here again. It really behooves all of us to have the infrastructure and the, um, you know, physical infrastructure with Wi-Fi and all of that, but also the planning infrastructure for teams to do the hard work to try to figure out, well, what does that look like when we transition? How can we still do our work and get our, our important things done? Um, I think it behooves all of us, and particularly managers and CEOs, to be uh, to have a pandemic plan ready to go because this is going to happen again. And and then I let you um, you take on the the physical city space. That's I defer to you about your expertise. Well, of course, I, ha I have no idea what the answer is, but I <laughs> will say that many uh, activists have long thought that nine to five transit planning oriented towards weekdays and towards uh, white collar office commuters makes no sense mm -hmm. and puts um, service workers at a huge disadvantage, uh, childcare workers at a disadvantage, people who work odd hours. Um, so there is a movement to try and move away from that kind of uh, planning. Uh, I will also share an anecdote that I heard the other day from Robert Fogelson, who's a historian. He wrote a book called The Great Rent Wars, which was about the rent strikes in New York City in the 19 teens and 20s, which led to the nation's first rent control laws. And one interesting thing that happened then was that the laws were only applied to residences and not to offices. Hmm. Now the landlords uh, trying to raise the rents would often say, but you use this apartment as an office because in, that day, in, in those days you did have many people who would work from home. Obviously they weren't knowledge workers. They were more likely tailors or hmm. pickle makers, or, you know, all kinds yeah. of weird early 20th century jobs that people did from home and landlords would spend a lot of time trying to root out exactly who was working from home because if they were working from home then they could raise the rent oh wow that's really interesting um let's see so we have another question here uh this one is from gabriella she asks uh what about not having supplies or technical equipment to work from home academics are suffering from that right now yeah i mean this part th i think this is all part of you know being prepared for something like this to, to happen. Um, you know, I think this, it behooves managers, CEOs, workplaces to be thinking, to be thinking like, you know, what do your people need at home and how can you help them get that? So it's not, you know, my neighbor next door, you know, right before I, I live in Virginia. So we just had our stay at home order that came out last night and <laughs> ran out to go get a printer, you know, and uh, I'm sure that wasn't, uh, you know, um, something that they had planned on doing, but um, we are scrambling right now. And I, and, and I think yeah, I, I'm, out, I'm almost out of printer ink myself. So yeah, how can we come up with systems and plans? And I think this is part of really being serious about taking pandemic planning um, in, in workplaces. Uh, here's a question from uh, Leah who asks, uh, I was in management consulting until the travel uh, to be in person four days a week got to me. Do you think we'll see a shift in that way of work coming out of this situation or is the value of face-to-face -to -face too valuable for this high value strategic work? <laughs> too valuable in whose mind? You know, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting so angry again. <laughs> but I think that that, that that just really shows so much of the FaceTime bias that a lot of workplaces have. There is no doubt how important it is to have some face-to-face -face con connection. Relationships are really important. Building those relationships, particularly in management consultant, you wanna build relationship and build trust because then you can get your work done. But does that require you to be on the road four days a, a week? Uh, you know, Again, that's something that has really drummed a lot of women and caregivers out of those positions. I think it's time to have a, a reassessment of that. You, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of work that's been done and people keep doing it because it's the way we've always been doing it. And there's a real status quo bias. And I think maybe this is the time to really to take a hard look at some of those biases. Yeah. Um, William asks if uh, 
expanded work remote uh, work remotely arrangements will result in a shift towards a higher percentage of gig engagements um, and I guess away from full-time salaried workers. Well, you know, that's already been happening, you know, um, and certainly not as fast as some, uh, some people predicted, but there is a rise in gig and contract work. There is a rise in the kind of work where the risk is shifted away from employers onto employees. You know, and if you are a if you're a software engineer and your skills are in high demand and you know they're up to date, you know the flexibility that comes with gig work because you can probably command a high salary so that you can cover your own benefits like healthcare. You know, maybe that flexibility is worth it to you, but not a lot of people are going to be in that kind of position. Um, you know, and I think that this is part of this, these are sort of the, these grand questions that were already on the table, sort of around future of work that I think coronavirus has just brought into really stark relief. I think that's a really important question to ask. What kinds of jobs are gonna be created in the future and who's gonna bear the risk? And if we leave it all on the workers, like gig work and contract work does, you know, I mean, just look what's happening now when you've got employer provided healthcare, um, you know, now you've got 3 million people who are gonna be without healthcare. So if we're gonna to move to more risk on onto gig workers or contract workers, then we really need to rethink the social contract. Do we yeah. have portable benefits then? Do we have a different kind of safety net? You know, you look at Denmark, they have what's called flex security. They give work, uh, uh, companies great flexibility to hire and fire kind of at will like we do here. But then the flip side of it is they have this incredible safety net. And when I've spoken to people there, you know, that Denmark is supposed to be one of the happiest countries on earth. When you ask him why, it's like, because I know that no matter what happens, I'm never going to be sleeping out on a bench. And you know what? We can't say that here in the United States. If, if, if there were ever a, a case for seeing healthcare detached from employment, uh, I think we're seeing it right now. And you're absolutely right. Um, here's, here's a question from Ty who asks, uh, body, body language and nonverbal communication is powerful in an in-person environment. How can we make sure there's space for emotional communication on the web. And I think this, this gets what I was asking earlier, like, like video conferencing is good. We're here, we're having a nice conversation, but it's still no substitute for reading someone's uh, language in person. And what have been the best ways you've seen that, that sort of recreate uh, that vibe and, and allow people to sort of uh, ascertain what those cues are and so forth? Well, I think she's, you're absolutely right. There really is no substitute for that in-person communication. And human beings, we're social creatures. We will always crave that. That is how we communicate and connect best. So I think that we have to recognize that right now we're in a real, we're in a crisis situation. So we don't have the opp opportunity to kind of toggle back and forth between, you know, remote isolated work and collaborative in-person work. I think that's that kind of hybrid work is honestly some kind of hybrid is really the ideal but while we're in this bizarre and awful kind of uh, pandemic situation there are some things that you can try to do to kind of create hallway moments or those kinds of connections and some and people are already doing it and that's you know, hosting virtual happy hours where it, you're not talking about work where maybe you're not in your office if you've got a laptop you go somewhere else if you're in your pajamas, you stay in your pajamas, you know, you have a beer, I'm drinking tea, you know, make it informal. Uh, you can even, there are some teams that are really good at it. They've had like baby showers online and they play games online. There are ways to kind of create connection, recognizing that it's imperfect and that it is different than in person and it can't replace it, but that there are things that you can do to try to create more of that psychological safety and connection uh, that are really so critical for trust, for being able to work together, and also of what we humans need. Um, here's a maybe a final question from Nabina who asks, uh, can you forecast a bit about the care economy? Uh, for those who re relied on daycare for children while working, why is it assumed now that they must care for their children uh, while, while working at home during the pandemic? And is there a uh, smart solution for working mothers um, that doesn't involve uh, having to uh, resume childcare responsibilities when they work from home? Yeah, no, this is a really important question. And I, I would say that it's also interesting, it's also important to see how things are shifting. That in that past research would show that if women worked at home, they did all of the childcare and housework too. And that if men worked at home, they didn't. 
that's actually beginning to shift. So I think it's important that when we're talking about childcare options, you know, clearly women are still the default parent and, and, and the primary caregiver in most instances. But I think it's time to start kind of expanding that expectation and uh, recognizing that, you know, most children have, uh, you know, uh, more than one parent, if you're lucky enough. There, there are a lot of single parents out there that we also need to be, you know, recognizing and including in our conversations about this. But when it comes to the care economy, I think, again, just like we're finding so many of our systems, the kind of these market-based systems, in a pandemic, we're seeing the, the complete and utter inadequacy of them. We have a care economy that does not work right now with parents paying way too much for childcare, with providers who are like uh, working on razor thin margins and caregivers who are earning poverty wages. That is not a market that works. And it doesn't work normally in, in you know, non-pandemic pandemic times and during a pandemic, it's just showing how broken it is. And if nothing else, then it's, it's an opportunity to have these conversations about like, well, what kind of system would work? And then on the flip side, you look at the elder care, you know, uh, and you've got, uh, so we, we require, we need so many of these care workers. And again, they're making poverty wages. They're not, we don't pay them well. We don't treat them with respect or dignity. How can we, again, reshift what we think of as valuable and how can we create decent, get decent work? Um, you know, for the caregivers, how can we value the mothers, the parents, mm -hmm. uh, and the work that they do, as well as the unpaid labor? Um, I think right now in a crisis where you've got so many kids at home and you've got people who are expected to work and take care of or homeschool their children, well, then I think that managers need to understand, and this is not happening. I, I was just talking with a single mom whose work said, oh, you should be able to manage uh, working and caring for your kids, and they're one in three. And if anybody has been around a one in three year old, you know that there's no way that you can work full time and care full time for a one in three year old. So I think this also is time for management leaders, CEOs to step up and recognize the workforce has changed. We are not in the 1950s, and that good work can be done, but we are in an emergency in a completely unprecedented time period. And you cannot expect people to be super duper productive and still try to take care of all their kids. And so I think we all need to take a breath and ratchet our expectations down a little bit. You know, don't try to teach your three-year-old how to read. This is not the time to be a crazy intensive parent. You know, this is not the time to take on like a massive new project at work. You know, we are in a pandemic, we're trying to stay inside so that people can live. And let's remember that. This is unprecedented. And there are things that we can learn from it, but let's not expect to be super productive and super crazy, you know, caregivers. And it behooves managers to be part of the conversation. That, that uh, message that we should not try and be super productive during this pandemic and everybody should just relax a little bit, seems like a great one to end on. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Bridget, and thank you to everyone for joining us. There are more Future Tense social, dis social distancing socials uh, coming up on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Goodbye for now. Well, thanks. Bye.